we're all interested in what happens with the government. We read it on the news, we're bombarded by all the things the government is doing wrong, but what that leaves out is that there are pockets of innovation and the government can be a powerful force for positive change. It really is possible. And today on episode number 90, Vol, what episode? 94. <laughs> on episode number 94, we're going to be talking with a guest who will teach us about data and analytics in relation to innovation in the government. I'm Michael Krigsman with my fabulously friendly co-host, Vala Offshore. Vala, how are you today? Michael, I'm, I'm wonderful, and I'm super excited to hear from an incredible guest today. So please do the inter introductions, please. And Vala, I am particularly happy that I was able to ask you the right episode number, because I would have blown it. <laughs> well, it's my college graduation year, so I'm glad it's 1990. I like the 94. That's great. And we're, we're here with Anish Chopra, who has had a, a distinguished career. Uh, Anish, welcome, and why don't you share a little bit about your background? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm real uh, thrilled to be a part of today's discussion. I most recently had the pleasure of serving as the President's uh, Chief Technology Officer in the first term. It was actually the first time the U.S. government had established such a position. Prior to that, I had the honor and privilege of serving as Virginia's Secretary of Technology under then Governor Tim Kaine, now one of our two U.S. Senators. And before that, spent nearly a decade in the private sector uh, on the healthcare side, focused on banking and uh, technology and advisory service uh, at a firm called the Advisory Board Company and uh, pre uh, prior to that in the, uh, uh, at Morgan Stanley. So I've had a lot of fun thinking about uh, healthcare, the implications between the public and the private sector, and then uh, joined the public sector to see if we could do a better job of catalyzing breakthroughs to really help us uh, deliver a better healthcare delivery system, and along the way find ways to apply those lessons in health, education, energy, and other markets. That's incredible. Uh, Anish, can you uh, talk a little bit more about your primary role as the first ever Chief Technology Officer for the United States? So President Obama, when he was candidate Obama, used to, uh, in every major speech, talk about this uh, technology or innovation gap that he'd seen between the public sector and the private sector. And much of what he spoke about was the need to have leadership to close that gap and to make sure that we could do two things. One, uh, obviously grow the economy, and two, uh, solve some of the big challenges that we face as a country. And when I took the responsibility as CTO, he'd asked me to basically advocate policies that would accomplish both of those things. By closing the technology and innovation gap, can we in fact uh, grow the economy and solve big problems? And so we turned that um, homework assignment from the president into a very uh, focused effort on what I later called the Open Innovators Toolkit, a set of ideas that we could execute from Washington that can be replicated at all levels of government. And they briefly focused on four specific things that we spent our time doing. One was opening up more government data. Two was working in the convening role of government to lower barriers to entry and encourage the adoption of industry-wide standards, allowing more entrepreneurship and innovation in, in regulated sectors. Thinking about the role of uh, challenges and prizes to find non-traditional problem solvers getting beyond the Beltway bandits who normally respond to government calls for support. And then last but certainly not least, I'm a disciple of Eric Ries's book, uh, The Lean Startup. We thought about how to apply the principles of a lean startup in tackling very specific broken processes in the government or new product development launches in the government. And so those four aspects of ALA were the heart and soul of what we focused on in, uh, in my role as CTO. Incidentally, we also um, are real adherence to the principles of Lean Startup, and in fact, we've had Steve Blank and Alex Osterwalder on CXO Talk in the past. Uh, so, so how would you summarize your, what, what was your, your primary goal 
were your primary function as CTO? Were was it as a change agent, or, or how would you summarize that? Yeah, no. I, well, first and foremost, at its core, it's an advisor to the president. I reported directly to the president, and that often meant ensuring three things: one, that he had the best information he had to make decisions that would uh, end up in policy. So as we rolled out laws, as we thought about um, executive actions, how might technology, data, and innovation contribute to those? So number one, it was some policy advice to the president. Number two, it was ensuring that as we executed policies that we did as much as we could to promote uh, interagency cooperation. Basically, a lot of these initiatives required cooperation from Department A, B, C, D, and E. So we sort of had to create mechanisms to make sure that they were all on the same page. So I often found myself leading these interagency efforts. And then last but certainly not least, to in part to close that innovation gap, it was to do a better job of building a, a relationship with uh, entrepreneurs and innovators. And so it was a, an external outreach and engagement strategy. My successor, Todd Park, says it better than I do, which is uh, we can publish all the open data in the world, but if nobody knows to use it, then it doesn't really make an impact on people's lives. So reaching out and uh, cultivating these broader communities who want to take these uh, opportunities to innovate uh, and put them into production. So those were the three specific things, Michael. It was advice to the president, coordinating as much as possible to execute the vision, and then uh, working collaboratively with, with external stakeholders to put the, put the ideas into practice. And now today you're leading uh, Hunch Analytics. Yeah. Can you uh, talk to us about how, you know, how does Hunch relate to what you did as the U.S. CTO and a little bit about this exciting, uh, you know, initiative that you're leading? Well, uh, in many ways you could think of Hunch Analytics as a, as a chance to eat the dog food that I was <laughs> serving, <laughs> meaning, uh, you know, my premise in a nutshell, my premise has been uh, in service to the president that, the next decade of problem solving will largely be the result of better public-private cooperation. Mm -hmm. And the four techniques that I outlined, whether it be opening up data, engaging in standards, responding to challenges, thinking about staffing up uh, lean startups, these all had a public-private interface dimension. So part of the opportunity that I see now is to take advantage of these newly available data sets and to do my best with some of the more sophisticated analytical techniques that are on the market today in combination to build products and services that will make health and education markets more productive. And so just as an example, we uh, in September, we launched a website called veteranstalent.io as a proof of concept done out of a collaboration with um, Workday, LinkedIn, Monster, and many other stakeholders in the public and private and academic domains to map the unemployed veteran skills gap and to see if we could, taking advantage of open data sets, do a better job of proving matching skills, the skills people have coming out of the military when they're looking for work against the skills that are in demand by job postings that may actually have different job titles in different uh, industries, but their underlying skills might be more adjacent. Can we do a better job of, of giving people a shot at the American dream and so that small example is one that we focused on in addition to some work I'm doing in healthcare. And you had, I saw a blog post um, by the wonderful uh, Leanne Levensaller from Work yes. is describing what you were doing. Yes, yeah, so this is an example of public-private cooperation. So here's a sm small little minor example. One of the um, policy initiatives that we championed in the first term, the president launched something called the Veterans Job Bank. And it was a lightweight, open internet standard that any uh, employer in the country could adopt to say, I'd like to make a veteran hiring commitment and to signal that commitment in a job posting basically by appending some metadata to the, uh, to the job posting on the internet. And all the internet job boards, uh, all for free, voluntarily offer employers the chance to, to tag this job. Well, Workday is in place in hundreds, if not thousands, of organizations around the country. And in that collaboration, Workday launched a simple service that make it, makes it easier for their own customers to participate in this initiative without much friction. So you see this policy idea, stakeholder participation, entrepreneurs like those who work at Workday bringing these ideas to life. And so I hope this is sort of the recipe for how we're going to fix uh, a lot of these big challenges. Sure. 
Now, as a CMO, certainly, you know, working towards, you know, developing more of a precision marketing yeah. culture and ecosystem, I certainly and my team value data. But I would like your perspective. Could you share with our audience, because we have, you know, lots of business professionals, your view in terms of importance of data, in, 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 in it, whether it's, you know, for private, public, or any other endeavor. So my broad view is that we're entering an era where the power of recommendations engines, uh, which is really one manifestation of multiple sets of data, feedback loops, and other uh, basic approaches to, to data management, can manifest themselves in the way we live our lives better. We've seen uh, marketers with very strong uh, success think about how uh, custom audiences, given uh, their own analysis, might benefit from service A or B. And we've not seen that same thinking or approach in some of these regulated sectors like healthcare or education. Just to give you an example, if you're, we're, I think, nearing the end of the enrollment process for the uh, second round of Obamacare, if you were to shop for health insurance today, you've got a wonderful array of choices that you could pick from. But there aren't a lot of recommendations engines who say, you know, Anish, if you shared your medical history file with me, your blue button file, that, which is an open data set that every individual is entitled to access, which is I can get from every hospital, doctor, or insurance company an electronic copy of my own data. So if, if a service said, hey, if you share that data with me, I'll personalize recommendations only to show you the plans where your doctors are in the network, as an example. That value add would mean that more precise message uh, as a marketer uh, is something that I hope would lead to better, I uh, call them conversion rates, but actually choices that are going to improve people's lives. And on the education side, and this is the more depressing thing we noticed in the um, data analysis we had done on veterans, if you take a look at the decisions veterans had made in choosing higher education institutions, they had, as a group, dramatically underperformed on the selection of institutions to attend for skills acquisition uh, far less than the general population in terms of given the skills that they had and the opportunity for economic advancement, they've made choices to enroll in institutions that have not been nearly as helpful to get those folks um, uh, uh, the skills they need to compete for the jobs in the future. So this idea of using data to be more precise in carrying a message hopefully a message that will improve the welfare and the well, the well-being of the customer in question is an opportunity throughout the private sector, but especially in the uh, health and education markets where we could benefit from these kind of smarter recommendations engines. And these, you know, the power of data as a, as a kind of glue to bind together uh, the, the, sources of assistance with the people who need that assistance is very clear as you're describing it. However, what, how, does, how does one choose and make decisions about the types of problems that are best solved by the use of large-scale sets of data and the associated analytics? So this is where the public-private uh, spirit really comes to fore. Uh, and I would look at this in really two dimensions, top-down and bottom-up. So uh, let's start with top-down. Uh, on the occasion where society is actively seeking innovative solutions that could combine uh, data sets to help achieve a particular objective, there are specific initiatives. And in fact, we uh, at challenge.gov, which is a platform we stood up in the first term, every federal agency that is to say, your question was which industries or which topics hold. Every federal agency has the right to issue a challenge or a prize to the public sector, often in combination with data sets that are freely available, to encourage folks to look uh, for opportunities. So you, you, you'd find in this example, Michael, people who wouldn't not normally think to solve a particular problem, hearing about this challenge and then responding. What One small example of that. Uh, one of the departments was interested in the issue of infant car seats. Turns out half of the American public install these infant car seats in a suboptimal way. That is, they're not properly installed. 
turns up a database at the Department of Transportation of all the locations in America. Anyone can go to validate that they've installed the, the seat correctly. So in response to this sort of challenge, which is how do we juice the number of people who have got accurately installed car seats, uh, and we've got this data set, over a weekend, someone who wasn't in that line of work built a, an iPhone app, effectively, that allowed you to figure out based on your GPS location where the nearest place is you could go to find your, uh, get your car seat checked. So, small example. So, top-down is agencies seeking out uh, entrepreneurs and innovators to help solve problems. But I'm, I'm more bullish on the bottom-up. And the premise behind bottom-up is if the default setting in government is open, that is to say, every data set shall be made publicly available. And if anyone chooses to build products and services reusing that information, well, God bless them, this is America. They have every freedom and right to do that. Vinod Kosla had invested in a, a company called the Climate Corporation. I'm sure others were investors in that as well. They had repurposed census data and weather data, among other data sets, to create whole new models for crop insurance. And those more specific, uh, you know, kind of climate change insurance policies, you might call them, were so effective that Monsanto recently bought the company for nearly a billion dollars. And so this bottom-up idea that the data is yours by default, you're an American, this is yours, you're entitled to it, uh, has created opportunity. McKinsey estimates that this is between a three and five trillion dollar opportunity for economic value creation, and uh, that just in that's just in these seven or eight regulated sectors of the economy where new sets of data are being made available. So top down, bottom up. We want to encourage entrepreneurs to go directed on some of these issues. We want to see what they can do bottom up. So a few weeks ago, Anish, we had Vivek Ranavande, who's the uh, um, owner of the Sacramento Kings. Yes, among many friends, of course. Oh, fantastic. Great. I, I actually assumed that you were friends. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Vivek talked about fast data. He talked about the importance, regardless of the size of data, to deliver insight to users, whether that's fans in his scenario or business uh, line of business owners, fast data so that we could have rapid decisions and actions. And as you focus, for example, in the education space, and we have student retention software, but as you talk about recommendation engines and predictive analytics and the importance of getting to the student in that first, second, third semester so that they're on the right path to finish on time, on budget. Do you see organizations taking advantage of analytics to help improve student success? And if so, are there some examples you can talk about? Well, that's certainly a growing field. Um, I remain an advisor to a company called the Advisory Board Company, and uh, they have been active in the higher education space. Uh, addressing issues of student retention is a growing area for them as they serve a a larger base of, has, uh, of higher education institutions. And that's wonderful, and I hope the private sector continues to drive that kind of uh, activity. There's a policy question, Bala, embedded in what you've just said. Mm. And the policy question is, who has the right to access sensitive data? So the key to any of this, uh, you referenced Vivek talking about um, FAST data, feedback loops matter. Uh, and the reason for that is you want to know for any given population of students, students who did this, this, and this ended up higher likelihood to drop out. Okay, yeah. you want to if you had the full loop, yeah. if you had a database of a hundred thousand student actions, and you had um, transactions data that would give you the ability to analyze for these patterns, then you can come up with a predictive model that could be applied against this particular uh, new piece of data. So this individual just had this grade and this behavioral issue appear in their student records. Um, others with that background have, have gone down this path and we recommend you intervene. So you need to have access to a larger body of data. We're struggling with this issue of bulk access to data for purposes of uh, developing those predictive models. So that's a work in progress for protecting privacy. There are institutions and organizations working on these problems. And then there's the individual real-time uh, data set, which is to say whether you've a, a formed an opinion, you've developed an algorithm because you've worked it on a larger base of data, I'm going to give you my particular uh, student record access. And so you can take my student record access, apply it against this larger learning graph that you've established, and spit back any valuable 
information. Arnie Duncan and I, in the uh, near the end of the first term, launched something called the My Data Initiative. And the premise behind that, very similarly to the Blue Button Initiative and Green Button Initiative in health and energy markets, was that the student is entitled to machine readable access to their performance data. Sure. Not because they're going to look at it. You and I can log into a student portal. Sure. That's interesting. But because you want to tap that feed into this predictive model that might be available on your own, that is, you buy it direct to consumer, or the university might offer it because they've embedded that in a service that they've, they've launched. It, there's lots of business models, but the key is you want to understand the feedback loop for a large body to understand patterns, and then you're going to want the specific individuals that are set to run against the pattern to provide those uh, recommendations. So it's a public-private interface. You've got to have the right policy framework. Am I entitled to that data? Can I share it with a third party? How does it work with privacy and security concerns? That's the, po the public sector side. Private sector side is having come up with the algorithms, the predictive model, and then providing back that uh, actionable service. We, uh, Anish, we have a question from Twitter from Arsalan Khan, who's wondering how much of this government data has actually been released? Or I guess another way of saying it, to what extent is the government, are people in the agencies releasing this data? And to what extent are people in the private sector making use of it? So this is at the heart of ecosystems, which is to say um, it is true in 90 days or so following the president's first uh, inaugural, uh, my colleague Vivek Kundra stood up the website data.gov. So we had a technical portal that could both publish and market the use of uh, data sets. And on one measure, you can count hundreds of thousands of data sets that have been made available just on data.gov, not counting uh, the data sets that have been made available at state, local governments, and now increasingly around the world with international open government commitments. So there's sort of a measure you can qualify. Uh, I don't know if that's a useful frame, but at least it's a quantifiable uh, 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 point. There's the next layer of this is to measure impact, which is to say, are these data sets, uh, you know, valuable? And here you'll see spikes. Perhaps the most visible spike was in, I believe, the spring of 2014. Uh, Medicare, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, published for the very first time spending data on the top procedures in America for every doctor and hospital. So you could look up any doctor in America and say what was the most frequently uh, billed service that they made to Medicare. And this was, I think, a million downloads in its first few weeks of uh, uh, availability. So clearly one of the more popular data sets. And the premise was media outlets were consuming it, others were analyzing it. It led to a lot of um, uh, articles about, you know, what is exactly going on in the nation's Medicare system, for good or bad. So I think a better dimension is this notion of measuring kind of demand or value for data sets. I don't have a number, I can't tell you that you know 2% are the most valuable, but my presumption is a subset of the data sets on data.gov are being valued quite well in the, in the uh, public and private sectors. And then the last dimension is um, how many folks are building apps? I don't have a kind of industry-wide analysis, but McKinsey in 2013, or maybe 2012, had published a report just on the healthcare side. Over 200 new products and services were born in, la in the first few years of this open health data movement. So that's just one secretariat, uh, uh, you know, with one particular focus area at one moment in time. So I'm I'm presuming we are now well into the thousands of public apps applications that have been built by the private sector for uh, either for free or for earnings to, to be to be successful as a business. Now you wrote a book called The Innovative State. Yes. Why don't you tell us about the book, why you wrote it, the, the key premise. What was the, why take the time and write a book? Why was it so important to you? Well, firstly, uh, in the bio of what I've done, there was a small missing chapter, which is uh, the time between my leaving the White House and my uh, launch, uh, Hunch Analytics. I was a candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. 
I had felt, and I still do believe, that much of the problem solving that we need so desperately in this country will come from the states because the healthcare, education, and energy markets, while the national decisions have been largely been made, it's up to the states to implement these provisions and they can do so in a way that maximizes entrepreneurship and innovation in these fields or they can uh, do so in a manner that stifles it. So I made the choice to leave in order to seek this opportunity and when I uh, was leaving I spoke with the president, it's uh, fairly uh, common amongst aides to say goodbye to the president and to thank him for the time to serve. He had asked that I uh, prepare essentially a final memo uh, that summarized the big learnings. I was planning to do that anyway, but to get a specific assignment made it easier around uh, lessons that could be learned and applied more broadly. And I realized in preparation for it that uh, I had gone to the Kennedy School, and uh, I think that might have been Archon Fung. If I, your first question may have been for my, my uh, uh, future colleague at the Kennedy School, Archon. Uh, but as a student at the Kennedy School, I hadn't necessarily been trained on the techniques that we ultimately used in closing that innovation gap. So I thought, let me prepare this note for the president. We ultimately published it called the Open Innovators Toolkit, you know, on a uh, on the White House uh, gov slash open portal. And I thought, you know, there may be a chance to tell this story more broadly. It's been the case over the last several decades that the uh, federal government appears to have uh, weakened its position relative to the private sector in the use of technology, data, and innovation to solve problems, so this gap seems to be widening. But if you look back in American history since our founding, we've had more periods of time where the government has been innovative and actually has had the capacity to solve problems. This isn't some new concept that we're trying to introduce. So I thought, let's tell the story put in context. America has been an innovative state, and it can be again if we approach these uh, new principles and take advantage of these newer technologies uh, to connect in new ways with people and to release in clever ways the, the data sets that are so valuable. So my hope in the book was to really uh, frame up this opportunity to encourage folks to see this not as an ideological war, left versus right, but a collective vision that we move the country forward. And uh, I hope it's a, it's a formula for, for public sector uh, innovation at all levels of government. So that's what motivated me. What are some of the, you know, force multipliers that can, you know, make innovation more pervasive in, in government? So there were three private sector lessons that I learned in uh, preparing for the book that are critical to realizing this vision. Uh, one, as you mentioned, is the notion of force multipliers. Uh, is the second is the notion that you should tap into the expertise in frontline workers. And then last but not least, you need a cultural uh, uh, focus on making sure that the organization is open to the idea of collaborating beyond the internal walls of the enterprise. Procter & Gamble's commitment to uh, opening up its uh, research and development pipeline through a program called Connect and Develop really taught me how a CEO can ship move the ship, if you will, in a new direction and to get everyone on the same page that we should value external ideas. Uh, from Amazon, we learned about the imp importance of empowering frontline workers and uh, uh, offering a chance for them to contribute their ideas and their concerns in a manner that can actually inform uh, service delivery. And then force multiplier, in many ways, was the learnings I, I got from Facebook. Uh, Cheryl Sandberg uh, and I were on a panel uh, dealing with jobs in the economy early in the first term, and she had done some staff homework. Uh, her, she asked her staff to prepare some studies. You know, I think Facebook had 3,000 employees at the time or something like that. And she said, how many people have the job title Facebook developer? And the answer that came back was a bit shocking. It was 35 plus thousand. And that was not because they were on Facebook's payroll. It's because they had opened up the platform and basically force multiplied their own employee base so that if Nike or someone else wanted to have a Facebook developer on staff, they could hire them and train them to plug in and build wonderful new products and services. So I thought of that formula. I said, my goodness, we have 3 million civilian federal workers at that ratio. Could you imagine if we had 30 million Americans helping to build government 2.0? And what would that mean to our ability to connect and meet uh, uh, the people where they are and ensure that they get the services that they deserve? 
it would be an unbelievable thing. So force multiplier to me, Bala, is about that principle in context with the others, the learnings of what an open innovation system looks like in the public sector. Terrific. Now, you speak about the concept of handshakes and handoffs, which is a very trite glimpse into uh, some concepts that are very rich. So maybe tell us a little bit about that. Well, if I try to think about the simplest way of expressing what an innovative state is characterized by. Hmm. And these are two principles that are answer a lot of the questions I get about an innovative state. The first principle, this notion of handshakes, is meant to signify that this is a bipartisan collaborative effort. That is to say, the left and the right have already shaken hands and authorized that these policy tools be made available. Both parties have said we want more government data to be released in machine-readable form. We want the public sector to convene the private sector to lower barriers to entry and encourage the adoption of standards, especially in key areas like health and energy and cybersecurity. We, we should in, tap into problem solvers beyond the traditional beltway bandits, and prize authority now is available to every federal agency. And the principles of lean startup are constantly referenced in all uh, 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 public uh, discussions of how do we fix uh, the way government works. So handshakes, uh, Michael, are all about that core idea that this vision of an innovative state is not ideological. It is, in fact, uh, a, a kind of a bipartisan support and one that requires the second half, the handoffs. An innovative state can't do it on its own. It can't just pass a law and say, okay, we've got more open healthcare data. Great. We've fixed the country's healthcare challenge. We need handoffs. So this isn't a press release uh, on the announcement of a data set. It is an encouragement and an active courtship of entrepreneurs and innovators in the public, private, nonprofit, academic communities to bring those uh, resources from the government into products and services that help people's lives wherever they are. And that's the messy thing about an innovative state. Uh, you know, there is in fact uh, healthcare.gov, but there's also an API. So Stride Health can consume the data that is the list of health plans from healthcare.gov and can build a partnership with Uber so that specific plans that are better for drivers, Uber drivers that have back pain, can be recommended as a personalized recommendations engine above and beyond what they would otherwise do if they just went to the quote healthcare.gov site. The handshakes on opening up the data and the handoffs for Stride Health to build a product or a service that can be partnered up with Uber. Value creation to the drivers, value creation to Uber, uh, value creation for economic growth. But this is, this is complicated because you have to, to do this, it seems, to me, that there that you have the technology level, you have the political level, and yes. you have the cultural level that all need to be aligned. Otherwise, none of this can happen. Yes, and as a subset of the political level, I would argue business model level. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. In healthcare, the idea that someone should be treated earlier, uh, you know, when, when their condition can be dealt with perhaps in a more cost-effective manner uh, is better than waiting for them to show up in the emergency room is sort of Well, I think we've lost a niche. Your business model. There he's back. Perhaps the insurance industry that's on the hook might be willing to invest. Bob? As a, um, you know, as a, uh, you know, kind of a high bar if they were to measure, you know, a response in a due for their payback period. So the uh, challenge. to encourage groups of doctors and hospitals and insurance companies to come 
is delivered in the right setting at the right time. And in that process, if I can invest a few dollars in the technology stack and the data levels and the applications associated, I can actually realize a return. Anish, uh, you were cut off. I don't know if you can hear us. Can you hear us okay? Anish? You know, Vala, I think that once again, we are lost to the vagaries of technology. What do you think about that? Uh, I, 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 it may be only temporarily. I hope so. I'm not sure if Anish can hear us. Uh... But this is a, while, while we're waiting for him, you know, the thing that is striking to me about this is the, the multi fat when he talks about innovation, it is highly multifaceted, right? He's because he's talking. Uh, there's the there's the, the data integration level. There's the cultural dimension. There's the business model, right? So so all of these pieces need to come together. And if you don't have all of this coming together, then as he says, well, you know, you may have lots of great data, but but there's no one showing up. So so what? Yeah, I know it's also interesting and surprising to hear lean startup principles applied in government where through, you know, iteration and experimentation, uh, you know, we can achieve velocity. And uh, hopefully we can have Anish come back because my question would be, you know, how do you implement a lean startup culture in government? Um, well, that's what Steve Blank was was talking about. He's he was. Uh, and I bet that's a niche. So I'm gonna take that. Hang on just a second. Okay, sure. <laughs> First time in 94 shows where Michael gets a call. I apologize for those of you watching the show, and you can hear me. Hopefully, you can hear me, but we apparently have some technical difficulties, and uh, you know, hopefully, we'll be back on the air shortly. For those of you who are watching uh, today, I published uh, our 2015 uh, most social CIOs on Twitter via Huffington Post. Some extraordinary CIOs, uh, many government CIOs. In fact. Dr. David Bray was uh, the, the first mention in the list of 100 most social CIOs on Twitter. These CIOs on average have, I believe, close to 5,700 followers. They're on about 180 Twitter lists, and uh, they're all active on a daily basis on Twitter. We have CIO of the White House, Dr. Elisa Johnson, and, and many other uh, CIOs, not only in gover government, but also in education, healthcare, sports and entertainment, and other, other industries. So hopefully uh, you get a chance to look at the new blog by Huffington and SlideShare and provide me feedback. Now, I started with a list that was almost 300 strong, so I feel bad because there's certainly a couple of hundred more CIOs that deserve to be mentioned as, as social and active on Twitter. I will add the name of all the CIOs who I believe are social in the comment section of, of my post and hopefully you can help add more to the list and we can create a community where we can all learn from these executives who are volunteering their time to share their knowledge and insight with a broader community. Certainly I use Twitter as a personal learning network and I take advantage of learning from these 100 CIOs. Michael, I see you're back on. Hopefully, I'm uh, back on, but Anish is not back on. And here's where we rant and we rave about Google Hangouts. <laughs> because Google Hangouts kicked him out, and then it won't let him connect back in, saying something about it's taking too long to connect to the server or who knows what. Well, I'm sure if Google knew that they kicked out the former chief technology officer for the US, they would feel bad and resolve the issue quickly. Um, so, <laughs> well, I, I hope you know what. If any, if anybody listening out there knows somebody at Google who's a, affiliated with Google Hangouts, would you please t uh, connect connect me to them because I would really like to resolve these kinds of problems because you know when you have the first chief technology officer of the U.S. 
in the Hangout, it's really, really annoying when it kicks him out. How Especially that Michael, we had our best questions left for the last 10 minutes. So, <laughs> as well, we always do. <laughs> well, we will, we will invite Anish Chopra back, Anish Chopra back and, and I think that Vala, since the guest of honor is not here, I think the party's about to draw to a close. Well, uh, it was an incredible uh, 38 minutes before we had our technical difficulty. You and I are involved with technology every day, and the only time technology is defect-free is when it's obsolete. So things happen, and we'll, uh, we'll make sure we'll have a subsequent show to, to finish uh, our discussions with the brilliant Anish Chopra. And, you know, but, I, but Vala, I have to say that I don't agree with that point that you just made about, you know, technology is only reliable when it's obsolete because I just want this to work. This shouldn't be that complicated. It just should work. And I don't want to live on the bleeding edge. That's not, not for this, not where we have a bunch of, you know, a lot of people watching. Sure, sure. It's funny to hear it one of the top technology analysts in the world say, I don't want to live in the bleeding edge. I didn't, say, you that. Live. I didn't say that. No, 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 I didn't say that. No, I love the bleeding edge, but actually, you know, I'm like all these Life is the bleeding edge. I don't. Listen, I'm like all of these people in the enterprise where it's, it's one thing to talk about disruption, but it's something totally else when technology disrupts your business process. <laughs> and that's what's happening here, Paula. I, we have I, a business process, and technology has just disrupted it. We will perfect this by show 100. We're only 94 shows into this, so. <laughs> I don't think it can ever be perfected. No, I didn't say that. No, I agree. I agree. Okay, so let's let's make let's let's. Well, if the party's over, then it's time for you and I to go party. How's that? You got it. Well, I hope you have a great Friday. Sorry to our audience who are watching. We'll make sure that uh, we'll try to. Uh, you know, well, I don't know what we can do, but certainly this was a first. Out of 94 shows, I don't recall us abruptly ending a show, so. Not this way. So not All right, this well, way. Well, we, well, we say thank you to Anish Chopra in absentia for taking the time to talk with us today. It's, uh, we had enough time with him that we really got a chance to get into his mind and his thinking and his insights about data, and especially how data and uh, how government data can enable the private sector to, to benefit, namely all of us. You certainly did. Michael, have a great weekend, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk to you uh, next show. We'll see you next week, and thank you, everybody, for, for watching. We hope you have a great weekend, and thanks again. Bye-bye.